Hi, I'm Semben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Deciphering the Renault Zoe Onboard Charger, also known as the Chameleon. And the presentation is based on the patent application, a US patent application filed in 2012. Now, Renault electric vehicle Zoe includes a 40 kilowatt charger on board, also known as the Chameleon. It is generally assumed that it is based on the circuit disclosed in a Renault patent application. Now this is an academic analysis that I'm showing here of the operation of the circuit based on the patent application. Of course, it is quite possible that the actual uh, charger in the car uh, may operate a little bit or differently uh, from what I'm showing here. So my way is actually interpreting what is in the patent application and the way I think it could work. So the patent application is from 2012 and it is entitled Fast Charging Device for an Electric Vehicle and the SINE is Renault. So what is a onboard charger? Onboard charger will be a unit that connects the line to the battery and in a controlled way uh, feeds the battery with the current uh, to charge it. Now the Renault Zoe, they are different of course uh, models uh, been around since it was introduced but let's see it one of, of them uh, includes the 192 cells uh, in a configuration of 96 in series and 2 parallel and it has a nominal capacity of about 45 kilowatt, a voltage of 345, and it needs a charging voltage of 400 volts. Uh, the weight, by the way, is not negligible. It's 185 kilogram. So let me start off with the question of power factor that is needed uh, today when you connect to the line. Now it is generally uh, sort of conceived that power factor is cosine phi. Well, it is correct, but not entirely correct. Power factor, the definition of a power factor is the real power over the total power. So in general, we are talking about the voltage first harmonic, the current first harmonic, time cosine phi, divided by the total voltage RMS and total current RMS. Now obviously, if the one of them is distorted, for example, I'm showing here a case in which you have a voltage, which is a sort of sinusoidal, but the current, the black one here, is highly distorted. The part that really delivers the power will be the product of the first harmonic here times the first harmonic here, which I'm showing here in red. Obviously, this distorted current has a higher harmonics content which do not contribute to the power but only to well two losses because uh, the still the current is flowing through resistances so the real power is again the first harmonic times first harmonic cosine phi and this is the total power which in general will be larger than this now in the very specific case in which first of all the voltage is non-distorted if the voltage is non-distorted then this drops out and we get the power factor as the first harmonic of the current times the total RMS of the current times cosine phi if there is any and then if the current is not distorted then of course this drops out and we get back this cosine phi which is kind of uh, assumed to be the meaning of power factor, but again, this is for the very particular case of a non-distorted line and non-distorted current. Now, we are really interested in the case of uh, distortion. The reason is that if we just uh, rectify the input line and feed it to a capacitive filter, then the current that is expected is something of this nature. And the reason is that once the capacitor is charged, uh, there will be no current until the voltage at the input is really exceeding this 
voltage across the capacitor, which would be around here. So we're going to see a current like this, and uh, therefore we'll have a first harmonic, but then we'll have all the other harmonics, the third, fifth, etc., being a um, symmetrical uh, waveform. And therefore, this uh, current has a large content of higher harmonic. Now, this is now not allowed. There are some standards. For example, here is one standard, which uh, these standards have been adopted just about all countries, which uh, dictates the, a limit to the harmonics that you can have at the current. And the, these apply to uh, power above 75 watts for the general use, but for some specific uses, like say lighting, uh, actually the limit is for lower power. So what this uh, standard says is that uh, when you sell a equipment, uh, you have to abide with this uh, standard, which means that the harmonics will be at a given or lower than the given limit. And here's an example for a certain type of application, which is called class A. And here are the limits for the, for the third, fifth, and seventh harmonic. I'm not going into it, just to say that you have to worry about the power factor uh, when you uh, sell an instrument, otherwise it's not allowed. So how do we cope with this requirement? Now the classical way is to use a boost converter. Let me start with just describing what is a boost converter, just for a background, and then I'll go into the power factor. So a boost converter is basically a switch mode converter in which you have an inductor, a switcher, transistor, diode, and output voltage here. Now, when the switch is on, we are sort of charging the inductor, and then when the switch is off, we are sort of discharging it into the output. Now this uh, type of converter is a step-up converter. You can see that if the transistor doesn't work, the output will be equal to the input. So this is the lower voltage that you can have. You, can have, you can't have a lower voltage than that. But then, as the switcher is turning on and off at a given duty cycle, which is defined as the uh, T on over the period, then the output will be built up above the input. Now, as it turns out, the, the, the ratio of output to input voltages is 1 over D off. D off is the off time over the uh, total period. And as I've said, this is a step up converter. That is, it will um, produce an output voltage which is higher than the input. So this converter is now very popular for realizing a power factor correction now or active power factor correction. So what is the idea? We start with a, this is the simple way, there are many other uh, more sophisticated way which I'm not going into in this presentation. There are some other uh, videos that I've uh, posted in my channel that you are welcome to see which are discussing various uh, power factor correction topologies. So in this case, we have a rectifier, and beyond the rectifier, we see a rectified full wave rectification. And then we have a boost converter, which now has an input like this, and a duty cycle, which is now variable, because the voltage at the input is changing. So you have to vary the duty cycle, such that the output will be the one that you want. Not only that, there is a feedback here measuring the current. This is the current coming in, okay? So you measure here the current, and you have a closed loop here, a regulator, such that it is enforcing the current in the inductor to have this shape. And this will be but just of adjusting a little bit the duty cycle up and down, such that the current here will follow this waveform, aside from the fact that the average output will be the one that you want through this outer feedback. So we have actually two feedbacks here. And once you have a current which is of this waveform, then as you look at the input before the diodes, 
you see a current which is sinusoidal because these dards are sort of inverting uh, the uh, current at one half cycle. So this is a very classical uh, power factor correction circuit, has an AC input, then has an output, and uh, the output, as we understand now, will have to be above the peak value of the input voltage because this, inver this converter can only step up. So if this is a 240 volt, the peak value is 340. It means that um, in regular operation, this should be around 380 to 400 volt here. This will be it. And then you have the inner uh, loop that will ensure that the current of the inductor is of this waveform and therefore you can now have a sinusoidal waveform at the input. Now of course they need a uh, filter for the high frequency ripple, I'm not going into it, I'm just talking about the basic uh, power factor correction unit. Now the quality of the power factor, that is how much harmonics uh, do you have, will primarily depend on the uh, control loops that you have here and how well do they cause this current to be of a sort of rectified sinusoidal or full wave uh, waveform. So now we move to a buck converter. The buck converter is a step down. In this case we have the transistor here in series with the input, then we have a diode, and when the transistor is on, we have the current flowing this way. This is actually charging the inductor and also passing current to the output. And then when the transistor is in the off position, we have a discharge of the inductor into the output. So we have a so-called continuous current to the output during charging, during discharging. And again, in this case, if the transistor is on all the time, we have the output equal to the input. If the transistor is operating, then we are sort of chopping the input, so therefore the output will be lower. So this is a step down, and the ratio between output to input is the duty cycle, so the output is lower than the input. Let me now move to another concept, that is the average current across an inductor. Well, as it turns out, in steady state, the average current across the inductor must be zero. The reason is that if it is not zero, then the current will be building up to a dangerous and eventually it will uh, burn the inductor. This means, for example, that if we look at a, say, a buck converter, we have an average current here V out. The average current here, which is, well, this current may look like this, then the average of it must be equal to this. Oh, and this is done actually by the uh, control. Now the question is, can a buck converter be used for power factor correction? So suppose we have a rectifier, uh, then we have a rectified waveform here, and then we operate the buck. Now the buck is a step down converter. So therefore if we have an output voltage of a given value, here it is, then obviously the current can flow only when the input is higher than this because it is a step down converter. So therefore during this period when the input is lower than the output we are not going to have any current and then we're going to have a current only during this period. We can control it but they've been missing here portions here. So therefore this is a uh, situation in which we cannot get a sort of a perfect power factor correction because of these uh, limits. Let me move to just another concept uh, which we're going to use and that is a synchronous operation. Now I've been showing the buck and the boost with a transistor and a diode. Now it is possible and actually it's uh, beneficial to replace the diode with a transistor such that when the diode is supposed to conduct we turn on the transistor. Usually there will be both transistor in parallel to a diode and once we turn on the transistor the voltage drop across it is lower 
if we choose the proper transistor, lower than the voltage drop across the diode, and therefore we are going to have a um, lower losses, which is of course very nice. So we can do it with the buck, this is the buck, with the input, and the diode, or with the boost, this is the switch, and here is the diode. So let me now move to a three-phase system. In a three-phase system, we have, of course, uh, three lines here, except for the neutral that we might or may not use. Now, obviously, just to Kirchhoff, the sum of the current is zero. So therefore, if you know two of these, uh, the third is determined. That is, um, so also you might say, if you control two of these, then the third one is controlled. Now, the three-phase system has many, many benefits. I'm not going into it. Uh, one of them is the, the, the fact that you need less copper, that is the wire cross-section of the wire for the same amount of power as compared to a one-phase system is lower. Also, we have a rotating machine. And what is very nice is that you can use a buck type converter to realize an active power factor correction which you cannot do with the one phase as I've shown before. So why can you do it? Well, first of all, let's have a look at the three phase. We have three waves here, voltages. This is the voltages, which are shifted 180 degree, the sum of which is, of course, zero. You can see here the vector presentation. This is phases here, it's a, the A, B, and C. And then if I... Uh, add uh, these vector, I come up to zero again, which means that the voltage sum up, similar to the current. And here we have now a situation of a three-phase converter. We have six switches, three half bridges, a diode, similar to the uh, buck, an inductor, and an output section. So this is the basic buck three-phase active power correction that can be realized with a three-phase system as opposed to the one-phase system. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is that uh, we are now connected in between the phases and um, so the voltages here are changing according to the three-phase uh, waveform. Let me show it here. So we have the three phases and now at any given time at every given segment these are sort of chopped into segments in any given segment we do have between any sum or some of the uh, two phases a voltage which is high for example here you have a high voltage and here you have also a high voltage and here you'll have a high voltage that is uh, you can find the situation that you can always find a high voltage between the two phases higher than the output, which is fine, because at this instant, you can then pump in current from the input to the output via the switches with a buck converter that needs a voltage which is higher than the output. So by selecting the switches, and I'm going to show it here a little bit in more detail. For example, here, here we have a case in which just the diode is conducting. And then we have a case here that this transistor is on and we modulate this transistor. So therefore we can control the current that's going, going up. Okay, at this particular instant, obviously we have to choose the segment in which this voltage difference here is higher than the output. And here's another case in which uh, we uh, modulate this one, this one is off, this one to um, turn this one. So we'll have a sequence of uh, part time of this one, part of this time, and part time the current is passing through the uh, diode. Let's have a look at here. Uh, we see here then uh, the voltage, this is now the voltage across the diode, okay? So what we see here is the voltage VAC, VAC during the, the VAC, then we see VAB, this is VAB, because when the switch is closed, we see the voltage here. 
and then we have a zero because the diode is conducting. And obviously, as I've said before, since this going, is going into the inductor of the buck, the average must be equal to V out. Now, not only that, in order for the current in each one of the phases to follow the voltage of the phase, because we want the current to follow the voltage of the phase, then therefore the length or the timing should be such that the length of this segment here, or this period here, is proportional to the value of the voltage. That is, the higher the value, the longer we'll have to have this segment. This is not VAC, but it has to be proportional to the phase voltage, that is, this voltage here, okay? It has to be proportional to this voltage here, because we want the current to be proportional to the voltage, and therefore, this timing has to be adjusted to be proportional to the um, phase voltage, while the average, as I've said, has to be equal to the output voltage. Now, obviously, we need some sort of a, a rule of how to do the switching. Well, there are two ways to do it. One of them is in an open loop, and for example, we see it here. We have a, this is now another configuration. This is from a paper by uh, Professor Collar and his uh, co-workers. And uh, this topology has been around. This the topology itself is not uh, uh, new here, but uh, the new is the way they have realized the converter, primarily putting transistor in, in, in parallel. I'm not going into it, just showing the waveforms and the topology. So what we see here, if this branch is realized, or this half bridge by two uh, parts, each one is a transistor and a series diode. So you have conduction only one way. And also this transistor can now turn off this branch completely. So there will be no current the other way, which could be a danger. So this is because if this is a MOSFET, for example, uh, we do have the internal diode, but it is in this direction, because note that this is the source and this is the drain, this is for this upper one, and here is the series diode. So if this transistor does not conduct, there is no conduction. When it is on, then obviously you can have conduction this way, okay? This way, which you need, and this would be the other way. So this is the way of real life. By the way, there are three capacitors here. Uh, connect to the phases. Uh, this is sort of a artificial neutral point, you might say. So therefore, the voltage on each one of these capacitor is the phase voltage, and therefore, uh, you can use it as a reference for the timing. As I've said, the timing has to be proportional to the voltage of the phase. So here is uh, a suggestion by uh, uh, in this paper, where it's actually coming from another paper, let's not go into the details, uh, of the duty cycle that you need in order to assure a proper active power factor correction for each of the segments. Uh, these are the sector, the segments, and here are the uh, duty cycles for the three branches. Now, the nice thing about uh, this uh, modulation method is that you can have some overlap between the switches mm -hmm. and this in fact helps uh, to uh, achieve partial zero current switching. But let's see how does this work. Now suppose we are in a situation in which uh, phase B is higher or higher voltage than phase A with respect. So we turn on phase B and as you can see phase A will not conduct because this voltage is higher than this one, so this diode is blocking. So I can keep uh, this transistor on for the given or required time, and at which time this VA phase will not conduct. Now I turn on uh, phase A, and I can turn it on under zero current switching, because there's no current here, I turn it on, and only then I'll turn off this phase B. Once I turn it off, this is off, 
and therefore current will start flowing here. So I can have here a situation of uh, zero current switching, which is very nice, reducing the losses. So this is for these two switches with respect to uh, this one. Now, one way, of course, is to operate in open loop, and then you have to figure out what is the exact duty cycle to maintain both uh, the output voltage and also the current. But uh, it's a little bit dangerous to operate in open loop for a number of re reasons. Uh, first of all, you do have some parasitic uh, parameters or elements like the resistance of the inductor, the voltage drop, which all have to be taken into account. Also, this is also extremely dangerous when you are charging a battery because battery has a fixed voltage. It's not like a resistor. A resistor, if you uh, sort of miss a little bit the output uh, control, then the current will be somewhat higher. But here, if the duty cycle is not right exactly, then you start to have very high current because it's like a short. So therefore, feedback is really required. So once you have a feedback, uh, life is really much simpler. Because if you have, say, if, they, if you like to control the output, for example, then you just take feedback from the output. Obviously, you have to identify the segment, and then also you have to know what is the voltage of the phase that will determine the length of the on time. But then you multiply it by the output of this of a PID controller, which is fed from here. So therefore you adjust the height of the duty cycle according to the required output. That is, the duration is determined by the voltage of the phase. If you have a battery and you like to control the current, you do the same thing. You measure the current. The length, again, is determined, the length of this, the, the on time is determined by the voltage, then modulated by, by this, and therefore you can control the current to whatever uh, you wish it to be. Now, there are many other topologies uh, similar to this one, and uh, here is, actually, this is uh, earlier than the one that I've shown uh, before. Uh, in which uh, only one switch is used uh, for uh, conduction of the two switches of one half bridge. And the idea is that with the four diodes, uh, you can cause the conduction in one way, and then you can cause conduction in the other way. Uh, but uh, today, um, it is preferred to use transistor, which we have, because we have very good transistor, the prices are going down. And therefore, um, a, you, a system with transistor will be of uh, lower uh, loss. Let me just mention, before going farther, that uh, we have in general converter or inverters of two types. We have a voltage source, source type inverter, in which, say, for example, you have a battery, you have the inverter, and you have the output. This is a very common uh, topology for driving a motor train. On the other hand, we have a current source type inverter, in which case we have an inductor in the input, and you actually feed current so to the load, to so the motor, say, uh, by um, modulating uh, the bridge here. And the rectifier we've been talking about is in fact a, a dual of this uh, inverter, because it's the same thing, only that the current is flowing now uh, in the, the other way. Here the power is flowing from the battery outside and here it is uh, flowing from the AC to the load. Okay, So these are actually uh, dual uh, topologies and uh, in fact uh, the, the equations would be very similar one to the other, just a matter of the uh, direction of the current. So I'm now going back to the uh, this patent application, and here is the basic circuit that we see here. Now we have here, we now recognize a three-phase buck converter with the inductor, and then we have a three-phase inverter. What are these? Now this inverter is the original motor inverter 
And this is in fact the motor. These are the three coils of the motor. So in regular driving operation, here's the battery, this is the inverter, and you feed the motor through the inverter. So this is during driving. Now during charging, you feed in the power here. This is now the rectifier. And here is, in fact, a inductor of the buck converter. Here we have three coils, but in fact, these are in parallel. And we can use the diodes of the inverter just to pass the current to the battery, because this is sufficient as a charger. We have a three-phase buck rectifier. Here it is. We have here the uh, input three-phase. We can generate the voltages that we need, and in fact here we need uh, voltages uh, between say uh, 250 to uh, 280 to 400 for the battery, which is okay for this inverter. So in fact, we don't need anything here except to pass the current. Now, unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunately, but the fact is that the coils are connected already here and we don't want to disconnect them, of course. And we, we can use now the coils as the uh, inductor. This is a high current. Uh, and therefore, if it would be an external inductor, it would have been quite a large size inductor. So this is quite, quite a bit of a saving that we use the inductor of the motor. And this is now the inverter or the rectifier, I should say, between the three phase and the battery. Now what happens if we want a single phase operation and it turns out that the Zoe can be charged either by three phase or two phase. If this stage now, this stage now is used as a this stage now is used as a rectifier, just a rectifier. Then we can generate a voltage here of this form like a regular boost active power factor correction. And now we can use the inverter as boost converter to build up the voltage to whatever value that we want. Now obviously we have here now three half bridges so we can operate each one of them and it will be beneficial to operate them in an interleaved way. These are the currents of these uh, coils. By this, we reduce very much the ripple. So this is basically a boost converter. This is a rectifier. So this is a um, regular active power factor correction, as we know it, which enables the charging of the battery from the one phase line. However, there are some problems that uh, should be considered here in the actual design of the system and the control. The first one being the fact that the boost converter is a step up, okay? So you cannot allow a voltage here which is higher than the output. Now, if the battery is discharged, and the voltage may be dropping to below, say, 340, 360, etc., uh, you might have a situation that the, momentarily the peak value here is higher than the voltage, and then, of course, the boost cannot uh, handle it, and there will be a very large inrush current here. Okay? So this is one problem. Now, you can overcome this by this bridge because this is an active rectifier so you can if the voltage goes too high you can just block this and so in this case you will not be passing current here which is fine it'll a little bit uh, harm the uh, power factor but this will be only for the case of a battery which is discharged so this is one problem here another problem is that the power coming from the line 
is pulsating. Because the voltage is pulsating, the current is pulsating, so the power actually is, comes in as sine square uh, of the phase. Okay? So this current now, or this power, causes a current at the output which is also pulsating. Now, of course, there is a capacitor here, a bank capacitor connected in parallel to the a battery, but still you will have a low frequency ripple into the battery. This is not considered to be very good, uh, but it is uh, possible, and this will be for the situation, of course, of a single phase. The current will be uh, lower, it's not like a three phase with a high power, so therefore this can be handled. So we have these two uh, issues that one has to take uh, into account. One is that uh, you have to make sure that at no point will the voltage here be higher than the battery and secondly that uh, you have to be aware that the battery is in fact charged by a pulsating current and this is due to the pulsating power coming from the input and since the battery is constant voltage then you have a pulsating current and this will be one of the uh, low side of this operation. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.